Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, we're excited to talk to you about the draft goals and strategies uh, for the next conference waterfront plan. Really hearing from you uh, about what you think about the draft goals and strategies and you know, get your feedback on it. So we're going to begin in just a few minutes. Um, before we do, please enjoy this short video, um, which takes you on a meditative journey along the North Shore of Staten Island. Um, and then we're going to begin with a short presentation and then open to open the floor to hear your comments and feedback on the draft goals and strategies. So uh, thank you and please enjoy the, the short, short video now. Um, and keep in mind that if you have any questions for now, please use the Q&A function, uh, which you should see on the toolbar on your screen. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us again tonight. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. So my name is Chris. I'm a planner, uh, uh, the, excuse me, a planner on the Waterfront and Open Space team at the Department of City Planning. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about the draft goals and strategies for the next Conference of Waterfront Plan. Um, so first we're going to have a short presentation uh, by Brendan P uh, Pilar, who's the Deputy Director of the Waterfront and Open Space team at the Department of City Planning. Um, and then we're going to hear from all of you, you know, what you like or, um, what you think about the draft goals and strategies. Um, so a little bit about logistics for tonight's meeting. Um, right now, all of your microphones will be muted, so you won't be able to unmute them until um, it is your turn to speak. So once we're at the public comments uh, portion of this, of this meeting, um, you'll raise your hand using the raise hand uh, feature. And once we call on you um, and it's your turn to speak, you'll be able to then turn on your video and turn on your microphone and we actually encourage you to do that, to turn on your video and to um, you know, share, your, share your feedback. 
So again, right now you won't be able to unmute yourself once it's your time to speak. Um, you will be able to, and in order to get on that list, when it's, when it's the public comment section, please make sure you raise your hand. Um, and then for those of you who are joining us by dialing in on the phone, um, during the comment section, please press star nine in order to raise your hand and so that you can get onto that list in order to share your comments. Also, if you're joining us from the phone tonight, um, press star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, you know, if you have any questions, uh, you know, please let us know. If anyone has any questions during this portion in the beginning when your microphone is muted, please utilize the Q&A feature, um, which you should, should see in your toolbar on Zoom as well. Again, so if you have any questions right now, use the Q&A um, and you, know, you can use that throughout tonight as well. Um, so again, looking at this toolbar, once your name is called, this, this sort of mute and unmute and video on and off feature will be enabled. Um, you can ask questions using the Q&A function at any time and make sure you raise your hand if you wanna speak um, and share your feedback tonight as well. I um, also want to share this help hotline that we have. So if you're having any technical difficulties, um, you know, with the presentation or with, be, with be, being able to share um, your thoughts tonight, we have a hotline. So please dial 877-853-5247 if you need any assistance. Um, and someone will be able to help you, um, you know, navigate the platform and make sure that you have a chance to, to share your thoughts. Um, so now we're going to start with a, a presentation. Um, so I'm going to pass, uh, pass the presentation to Brendan. Thanks, Chris. Chris, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear and see me? Okay. Yep. Awesome. Sounds clear. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Brendan Pilar, and I am the Deputy Director of Waterfront and Open Space Planning at the Department of City Planning. My team and I have the truly awesome responsibility of writing the city's next comprehensive waterfront plan. Uh, but of course, we don't do it alone. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight and for helping to shape this plan. Uh, I see many familiar names on the attendee list, uh, but also some names that are new to me. So whether you're, you've been with us throughout the process or you're uh, joining us for the first time, uh, once again, thank you and welcome. Uh, for a bit of context, uh, before we kick it off to all of you to hear the feedback uh, that you have on the goals and strategies, uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the city's waterfront and the draft goals and strategies that we have established uh, for the city's third comprehensive waterfront plan. The first bit of context is just the size of the waterfront that we're dealing with. At 520 miles, New York City's waterfront is longer than any three North American city waterfronts put together. Um, so this is just incredible, uh, this, the scope of the waterfront that we're dealing with is, is, is kind of the first kind of distinct feature uh, of the city's waterfront. Next slide, please. But it's not just the size of the city's waterfront that makes this part of the city deserving of a once in an every 10 year plan. It's really the incredible array of features that you can find on the waterfront from the wetlands in Northern Queens and Alley Pond Creek, or the hyper density of lower Manhattan, and the different strategies that are required to address the issues within each one of these areas. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned, we don't write the comprehensive waterfront plan uh, alone. Uh, we do so uh, with, in collaboration with uh, a number of agency partners that have roles uh, in and around New York City's waterfront, but also by talking to New Yorkers. Uh, this has been a foundational part of the, the planning process for over two years now uh, that kicked off uh, really in the summer of 2019 uh, by asking kind of big and broad questions about what New Yorkers want to see on the waterfront in the next 10 years. And as we progressed, uh, we narrowed the focus uh, uh, considerably uh, to dive into uh, topics, uh, uh, um, uh, topics about New York City's waterfront, from the working waterfront uh, to ferries to, to climate resiliency. Uh, we worked with uh, partner organizations like the Waterfront Alliance to host listening sessions in the fall of 2019 and the winter of 2020. Um, this Past uh, spring, we had to shift our, our engagement from in-person meetings, uh, where we really enjoyed the ability to meet with New Yorkers at and along the waterfront, uh, to remote formats. Uh, but this allowed us to try new techniques for reaching New Yorkers, uh, and we were very happy with uh, how we were able to uh, keep New Yorkers uh, interested and aware about all the features of New York City's waterfront. Uh, 
We then transitioned uh, in the fall to uh, remote public workshops uh, that were based on releasing a, a framework document. And this document was really the per first public facing document that we put out on the this third comprehensive waterfront plan to outline the preliminary goals and issues that the uh, waterfront plan would explore. Uh, we've then followed it up uh, this uh, May, uh, on May 3rd, uh, by releasing the draft goals and strategies document and uh, announcing uh, this series of, of, of public hearing style meetings to get uh, feedback from New Yorkers on the draft goals and strategies. Uh, we then have to uh, work over the summer to uh, wrap up uh, the, the goals and strategies uh, and release the plan. Uh, so it's been uh, a, a long and an exciting journey. And uh, again, we're happy to have many of you uh, been with us uh, throughout this process. Next slide. Um, so I want to share some of the general comments and feedback that we've heard on the plan and process. Uh, many New Yorkers have pointed out that this is a great opportunity to articulate a new and ambitious vision for New York City's waterfront. Uh, we have three beacons. These are really our principles for the process and plan, and New Yorkers have really encouraged us to uh, uh, carry them out uh, throughout the plan in terms of the language and in intent of the, the document. New, York, New Yorkers also encouraged us to be as specific as possible in articulating the goals. Uh, and also recognize that the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan is an opportunity to increase public awareness and education on a range of waterfront topics, including climate resiliency, ecology, public access, water quality, and water safety. Uh, and I'm confident that if you were to look at what we released uh, in the framework document last September and compared it uh, side by side with the draft goals and strategies, uh, I think I, I, I'm confident in saying that we've taken this feedback to heart. Next slide, please. So we're here, of course, to discuss the draft goals and strategies, and I'll just run through them quickly so we can get to the uh, public uh, portion of this uh, of this evening. The goals and strategies are organized under six themes, climate resiliency and adaptation, waterfront public access, economic opportunity, the working waterfront, water quality and natural resources, and ferries. And for each of these, I'll, I'll, I'll present a, a brief kind of vision statement, as well as the, the goals that are outlined in the draft goals and strategies document. Next slide, please. So the first theme is climate resiliency and adaptation. Climate change is the defining issue of our time and city agencies must collaborate with communities and each other in new ways to advance equitable, inclusive and holistic responses to climate change. Key areas of focus include expanding climate risk awareness and action, using climate risk information in public policies and investments, supporting the housing needs of waterfront residents, managing flood risk in the city's coastal communities, and promoting climate resilient design of buildings and infrastructure systems. Uh, in terms of the goals, we have five goals for climate resilience and adaptation. The first is to expand awareness of climate risks and understanding of actions that New Yorkers living and working along the waterfront can take to adapt to the impacts of climate change. The next goal is to apply an understanding of these risks to guide land use policy and decisions uh, about infrastructure investment uh, to support a thriving urban coastal floodplain. The next goal is to preserve and create a uh, create new housing for a mix of incomes, uh, but do so in appropriate locations and provide waterfront residents with resources to manage flood impacts on their homes. The next goal is to identify additional opportunities for coastal protection where feasible to manage the impacts of coastal storm surge and chronic high tide flooding. The last goal, uh, is to expand resilient design practices that enable waterfront buildings and infrastructure to withstand the impacts of climate risks like coastal storms, increased rain events, uh, extreme heat and sea level rise. The next theme is waterfront public access. Our waterfront will continue to be a place where New Yorkers and visitors alike uh, recreate and explore world-class parks and open space. At the same time, the city will invest in strategies to expand physical and in-water access where limited or obstructed uh, and better connect underserved communities to their waterfronts. 
There are four goals related to the public access theme. The first is to expand public access to the waterfront. The second is to ensure elements of design and programming of waterfront uh, open spaces reflect public use needs. The third is to promote the stewardship of public spaces on the waterfront. And the fourth is to promote opportunities to get onto and into the water. The next theme is economic opportunity. And while the waterfront is not the same kind of economic engine to the city that it was over 100 years ago, it will still play a crucial role in the city's ability to catalyze the green economy, sustain and create a diverse mix of jobs, host key infrastructure, and support tourism in the next 10 years and beyond. How can we go about doing that? Well, uh, we can promote job generating uses on the waterfront to drive economic recovery, diversify the city's economy, and to promote renewable energy. With those economic development strategies, we also need to focus on connecting New York, uh, uh, connect those economic development opportunities to uh, job opportunities and career investment, uh, career advancement opportunities. Uh, we can also do so by advancing categories of investments in waterfront areas that support uh, economic activity both locally and throughout the region. And by promoting uh, commercial boating to expand recreational and educational op opportunities and to help stimulate the economy. The next theme is the working waterfront. New York City's working waterfront and waterways are vital elements of our region's uh, economic engine, connecting New York City to the, the domestic and international supply chain and providing well-paying jobs for New Yorkers. By continuing to invest in the working waterfront and remaining uh, attuned to the needs of the maritime economy, we'll ensure that the port is readied for the evolving challenges of the 21st century, uh, including rising sea levels and changing patterns of consumer behavior. Uh, there are four goals related to the working waterfront. The first is to advocate for a 21st century working waterfront. The second is to invest in critical infrastructure to strengthen day-to-day -day operations of the working waterfront. The third is to expand the capacity of the working waterfront for emergency management. And the fourth is to advance programmatic operational and capital needs to promote marine and rail solutions to reduce, reduce our reliance on trucking. Uh, the next theme is water quality and natural resources. New York City will continue to build on its multi-billion dollar investment in improving water quality through a suite of programs and policies, including updating rules for how stormwater is managed and by implementing the nation's largest green infrastructure program. The city is committed to continuing to maintain and restore the waterfront's unique natural habitats and ecological diversity found in these spaces through robust planning, research, uh, and especially so in light of uh, the, the challenges of climate change. There are four goals for this theme. The first is to promote water quality by implementing planned programs and building on key agency and uh, public partner uh, collaborations. The next goal is to protect ecosystems, support ecosystem services, and enhance biodiversity of the natural waterfront. The third is to help connect New Yorkers with the waterfront, with waterfront ecology and raise awareness of water quality and habitat protection uh, issues. And the fourth goal is to utilize new and existing data sources to assess natural resources and inform decision-making for restoration and protection. The final theme is ferries. Uh, for a city located on an archipelago, ferry service presents a unique local and regional transportation opportunity. New York City will continue to expand, explore ways to optimize service and fully realize the potential of our waterways as a critical component of the city's transportation network. And you can actually hear part of that transportation network in the background that is the, the end train rumbling by. So apologies for the background noise. Next slide, please, Chris. Uh, there are four goals related to ferries. The first is to optimize routes and increase service efficiency of city ferry services. The second is to expand New York City ferry service to the planned routes, providing greater mobility to underserved neighborhoods. The third is to plan strategically for expansion of ferry services within New York City and the region. And the fourth is to strengthen the role of ferry landings as hubs to neighborhoods and other forms of transportation. 
Uh, just another quick run through uh, for how to get involved tonight. We'll be using the raise your hand feature to uh, kick off uh, individual three minute uh, uh, segments for providing feedback on the draft goals and strategies. Uh, we will call you in the order that you raise your hands. Uh, so please start doing so now. Uh, but before I kick it off for the public portion of uh, this tonight's session, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Morella, who will be the MC for the rest of the evening to answer any, answer any of the questions that popped up in the Q&A. Thanks again, Great. everyone. Thank you, Brendan, and thanks to everyone uh, joining us this evening. Once again, I'm Michael Morella. I'm the Director of Waterfront and Open Space Planning at the Department of City Planning, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to speak with you uh, this evening, and more importantly, to hear from all of you. So as Brendan said, um, in just a moment, we're going to kick off uh, the opportunity for all of you to speak, but there were a few questions that came into the Q&A. Um, I wanna just um, to clarify a few things. So in the Q&A, there are a number of questions that have, are about specific issues or, uh, <coughs> excuse me, specific issues um, or, sections of the uh, of the draft goals and strategies. Um, we're not intending to use tonight as a uh, as a discussion or a debate. It's really for the opportunity for all of you to be speaking to us. And so um, any questions that were posed regarding the the content of the comprehensive waterfront plan, I suggest that you raise your hands and use the three minutes um, that will be allocated to you to 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 um, to bring up those points. There were a couple of technical questions. I just wanna make sure that everyone um, has uh, familiarity um, with uh, how, to, how to participate this evening. So if you are interested in speaking, and I imagine most of you are, um, click the raised hand feature. And I'll, in just a second, I'll ask Tom to come on to um, explain how to do that. Um, uh, additionally, if you have any, uh, any technical issues, go ahead and dial the, uh, on a phone, dial the, the helpline that's uh, at the bottom of the screen on the Zoom call. Um, additionally, if, uh, and it's on the, on the, um, the, the screen right now. Uh, additionally, if you are dialing in, and I see that we have at least a couple of folks dialing in and you are interested in speaking, hit uh, star nine to raise your hand. Now, one of the things about, and we're going to kick off in just a second to start the um, the three minute uh, portion, the opportunities for uh, your public comments. Um, but do note that there's a uh, there's a the technology be behind this is that we are going to be promoting you uh, to a speaker role, and it's going to look a little glitchy on your end. It's going to look almost as if the website. Um, the Zoom opens and close, uh, closes and then reopens. Um, don't panic. Um, it should be coming back in just a second. And when you come back, uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself and speak. But um, let me um, turn to Tom Smith, um, who's helping out tonight with some of the um, behind the curtains. Uh, and Tom, if you could explain how to use the raise hand function, because I think that was one of the questions as well. Sure. Um... The raised hand function's now been turned on. So if you've joined us via Zoom, um, you can just move your mouse around over your screen and a toolbar will appear at the bottom where you'll see a little yellow raised hand. If you click on that, you'll be added to the speaker queue. Great, thank you, Tom. All right, with that, let's begin the opportunity for uh, all of you to um, provide us with comments. So Tom, who do we have as our first speaker? Tom, who do we have as our first speaker? You're on mute. I'm sorry. I hit the button too soon. Our first speaker is Robert Freudenberg, followed by Noah Chesnan, followed by Chris Ethimino. Rob, whenever you're ready, please begin. Okay. Hi, everybody. 
Uh, let me get back here. So thanks, uh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to offer this testimony. My name is Rob Freudenberg, and I'm the Vice President for Energy and Environment at Regional Plan Association, an organization that for nearly a century has sought to advance and advocate for research-based solutions to long-term problems. Uh, it's a highly developed, dense waterfront with 520 miles of shoreline. Uh, the city is centered directly in the crosshairs of the climate crisis. Uh, sea levels rise and storms worsen. The city must make critical decisions around existing and future development, particularly along the waterfront to continue to thrive while safeguarding its residents. In that spirit, we join you today to offer our comments on the draft goals and strategies. Put simply, we need to manage our waterfronts differently than we have in the past. These draft goals and strategies get a lot right. So I want to use my mind to highlight just a few areas and make some additional recommendations to them. First, the uh, time frame or the purpose of the comp plan is to provide a vision uh, for the next decade. These strategies wisely break out of that box. Uh, the current worsening impact of climate change dictate that we must consider how planning and development decisions made today should reflect not just conditions we live with today, but the future. So we commend the department for taking a forward-looking approach, particularly in its principles, to guide new residential development on waterfront sites. They essentially offer a new frame through which to view where and how we develop, places that can withstand anticipated climate impacts through 2050 and places that cannot. We, we recommend that you follow through on that and um, additional thoughts should be given to managing risk in these places beyond the 2050s. We're thrilled these uh, goals and strategies are, are supported by data, and we recommend the goal and strategies specifically describe uh, to which 2050 scenario climate risks are being considered. Uh, we support the idea of, um, of housing mobility and think that's an excellent way to kind of get through the thorny questions around uh, buyouts and retreat uh, by, by show, focusing on access to decent, safe, and sanitary homes into the future. Uh, finally, governance. Uh, we think that the next mayor should really take a leadership role in, in proposing uh, putting a high-level focus on the waterfront in a way that coordinates all the agencies and decisions that are active uh, at this really uh, dynamic place along the waterfront. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Noah Chesnin, followed by Chris Espinu, followed by uh, Valentina Jones. Thank you, Tom. Noah, whenever you're ready. Thank you, and, and I'll try to do my best to keep it to three minutes as, as Rob did so masterfully. My name is Noah Chesnan. I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society's New York Aquarium for the New York Seascape Program, which is the conservation program at the aquarium. We're excited to see this and, and I'll offer some, some detailed comments later, but to, to just start off, you know, I think you know, the aquarium is working to highlight the incredible biodiversity in New York waters generally, but including in the harbor. And, you know, to highlight, you know, whether it's the whales or the eels, um, diatomous fishes that we're studying in the harbor, there's exciting opportunities here for New Yorkers to connect with biodiversity, not just on exhibit or in far-flung places, but in New York City proper. Um, as, as an overarching comment, we offer our support for organizing this process, making it highly inclusive and participatory, and express high-level support for the goals articulated, especially in the natural resource goals and strategies section. Um, we, we, we would love to see a greater emphasis on marine and coastal wildlife and the need for conservation. The waters of New York City are facing many different potential impacts, whether dredging, tidal energy, ship, shipping, um, combined sewer overflows, runoff issues, um, and of course, climate is, as noted. And the, the opportunity to really draw on the data that's called for, but to make sure that it's included in planning processes to include, to be included in, in development uh, reviews as a part of the city um, process would be, would be one recommendation we may, we would make. Uh, we also encourage the city to look at ways to link coastal and harbor-wide ecological monitoring, um, and then to link that to some of the job and STEM career opportunities that are articulated. I think especially in reference to offshore wind. Those similar kinds of jobs can be applied to inshore waters and, and the ecological monitoring that'll be needed. Um, and that data can be used in a way that's looking at career opportunities as well as citizen science uh, and public engagement opportunities. 
We also wanted to highlight the importance of Coney Island Creek as a place that is worthy of continued and, and frankly increased city investment um, to improve water quality, to make it fishable and swimmable, um, and to use nature-based solutions, habitat restoration efforts um, that, that not only enhance the health of the community, but also the, the health of the, the, the local species as well that use the creek. And in terms of the ferry uh, goals, we, we propose as well that there's an overlay that includes supporting the ecological and conservation outcomes tied to the ferry and, and the benefits that that can provide. And we know that that's been an issue in Coney Island Creek and, and, and we hope that the citywide effort can, can also link in environmental issues. So thank you for the opportunity and I'll pass it back. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chesson. Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Chris Athemiu, followed by Valentina Jones, filed, uh, followed by Urvashi uh, Rangan. Okay, uh, Chris, if I may, uh, whenever you're ready to begin, please start. Oh, let me just put on. Um, The audio seems to be cutting in and out on my end. Oh, here we are. Okay. okay. Are you? Are you? Uh, can you hear me right now? Yes, we Hi. can. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you for uh, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, on the plan. Um, it's a great plan. I really appreciate uh, all the work you put into it. Um, I'm. I'm. Uh, I live uh, not far from the coast here. Uh, in. In. Uh, um. Um, Astoria, Queens. Um, I'm a resident here, and um, I really would appreciate if um, the plan would put more focus on how to, uh, you know, provide a lot of public access to the waterfront in terms of, uh, um, you know, like making, you know, like private developers a lot provide this access. Uh, you know, one of the issues we've had in in my neighborhood is, um, you know, a a private developer, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, putting up a fence and not allowing the public to, you know, you know, to visit the, uh, you know, you know, like, uh, uh, um, uh, um, to visit the waterfront, and you know, I feel like this is, uh, this is, you know, unfair, and I believe a plan should, you know, you know, really like emphasize that the public should have, uh, um, you know, this type of access, you know, in order to enjoy it. Um, I, I do, I do believe that the plan should also. Um, you know, put in something about uh, about teaching New Yorkers about the waterfront. You know, about the uh, um, about all the uh, um, all the, uh, the, uh, the the marine life and the uh, the kinds of you know history that the uh, that the waterfront has as well. You know, a lot of New Yorkers don't know much about the history. You know, behind uh, behind the city and and how how the city really grew from from the waterfront. Um, the only other thing I like to mention is. Um, I want to make sure that that the public has uh, um, adequate uh, um, infrastructure uh, to bike and to walk uh, along the waterfront. Um, I know there's there have been a lot of efforts to do that, but I really encourage you know more of this, uh, ma making sure that there are you know proper um, 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 like proper amenities uh, so that people could you know enjoy the waterfront as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tom, our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Valentina Jones, followed by Urvashi Rangan, followed by a dial-in caller whose number ends in 815. Hi. Okay. Hi, my name is Valentina Jones. I'm speaking on behalf of the Lower East Side Power Partnership. We have the Lower East Side Power Partnership has concerns about the housing mobility plan. According to section titled Cli Climate Resiliency and Adaptation Goal 3, one of the things stated is this scenario requires programs that facilitate housing mobility or the ability of New Yorkers to improve housing conditions and achieve stability by deciding to relocate uh, relocate is very often complex, complicated, and difficult to adjust to for the residents who would have to relocate. 
especially seniors, working adults, and parents. The Lower East Side Power Partnership advocates for every effort to be made not to force seniors, working adults, parents, and their children to relocate. The senior citizen who may already have orthopedic challenges may have to relocate and have to possibly adjust to changes in their daily routine, how they get their food, social relationships, ability of family members to regularly visit, distance to get to the grocery store, distance to medical providers, ability to get to medical providers who, may, who they may have an extensive history with. The, the working adult who have to relocate may see changes in the time it takes to get to and from work, which will impact other areas of their lives. Parents who have to relocate with their children have to change childcare arrangements, change enrollment of their children into a different school, change medical providers for themselves and their children. So once again, the Lower East Side Power Partnership advocates for every effort to be made not to force senior working senior citizens working adults, parents, and their children to relocate, as well as any other citizen of New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Urvashi Rangan, followed by a dial-in caller whose number ends in 815, followed by Linda Cohen. Urvashi Rangan, please begin. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. I mean, first of all, just thank you so much for this plan. It's so exciting for New Yorkers as someone that's lived in New York for 25 years and is a homeowner and a paddler in the rivers. Um, I'll just say kudos for this plan. It's really amazing. Um, and restoring the waterfront and increasing awareness across the board is really exciting for all New Yorkers. Specifically, um, I have a few comments to make. One um, is that the goal, it was great to have the goal of swimming outlined. We've had some real tragedies in the last couple of years with kids jumping in the water and not able to save themselves, literally. So love the goal of having swimming. Would love for you to add the goal of boating and teaching people boating, whether it's paddling or kayaking, it would be great to add that into the goal because it's a little hard to jump from nothing to swimming in the rivers and an, an additional incentive to help people learn how to swim would be the segue of boating. And so I would, we would just encourage you to consider that. Um, in addition, um, I'd like to talk about the um, launch sites that we already do have in Manhattan. And I understand that the goals do discuss um, expanding what we currently have and making sure that they're really usable. Um, that's a really important goal and we have a lot of launch sites. I'm in Upper Manhattan. We only have about three in Upper Manhattan in the Bronx that are available. Only one of those is partially available at high tide. The other two are not and one has actually been closed. And that brings up another issue because that Upper Manhattan dock is a public-private partnership with Columbia University. And I would just encourage this committee to really put some ground rules down for public-private partnerships. Our dock in the Skoda Marsh has been closed for a year and that's from Columbia University not repairing the dock and it doesn't look like we're gonna get that dock back anytime soon. Um, and that's a, that's a right of waterway um, breach really. And so we want to make sure that if we're going to have private partner publish uh, partnerships, that we are able to actually make sure that the public does have access to the water. If anyone's interested in that, we have a petition going with 200 signatures about at bit.ly forward slash fix the doc. Um, lastly, I, I'm in Boston right now, and I know it's a little taboo to mention Boston in a New York meeting, but I've been paddling here, and I can't get over the number of public access points on the water and would just encourage you to reach out to some cities that are near us to see how they've done it and how they've succeeded in getting their public on the water and really having community access. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hold my tongue about that small fishing village in New England. Uh, I'm a proud New Yorker, of course. Uh, Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is a dial-in caller 
whose number ends in 815, followed by Linda Cohen, followed by Rosa Chang. Great, thank you, Tom. And so for the dial-in caller with the last three digits of 815, please unmute yourself with star six and identify yourself and start speaking when you're ready. Hi, hi, it's Paula Kirby from Plaxall, and uh, very sorry that I have to attend only by phone this evening. I normally would do this by Zoom. Um, in any case, uh, you know, I'm uh, a member of a third generation family business, and we also own property in Long Island City on the waterfront. So um, I uh, have been watching this uh, for quite some time, this whole process, and been really impressed with your team. Um, you know, there are so many issues that are really important to us uh, as people on the waterfront, um, be it resiliency and uh, public access, um, especially, you know, when you're looking at Long Island City, where it's a 10-minute walk from, um, uh, from Queensbridge. And so, you know, we really, opening the waterfront to everybody is something that's incredibly important to us. Um, to segue on to your uh, previous uh, caller, we also host uh, the Long Island City Community Boathouse, um, which has allowed the public create access to um, kayak lessons and to kayak tours. Um, and I totally agree, paddling around uh, the East River is, is pretty amazing way to see the city. Um, so uh, congratulations to you and your team again for, for all you've done and, and how the process has been led. Uh, but uh, one one final comment and recommendation is I've noticed, you know, over the past few years as the ferry service has really taken off, um, especially for us in Long Island City, um, there are definitely some areas that are that are still sort of missing from that. And I think one area that could be really interesting would be um, to have a ferry stop somewhere on the east side in the in the upper 60s or, or 70s where it's so um, close to a lot of the medical institutions and could really provide um, quick access for people uh, to get to those hospitals, which are often difficult to get to from the subway system, very long walks. Um, and uh, and that that was one, one suggestion. Another one is um, I was driving by uh, LaGuardia this morning, and I remember my mother told me that there used to be ferries that went from lower Manhattan to LaGuardia. Um, and I was just wondering if that's ever something that might be in the cards in the future. So um, those are my comments. But again, congratulations to you and your team for all the hard work. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Linda Cohen, followed by Rosa Chang, followed by Charles Denson. Hey, Rosa Chang, please begin whenever you're ready. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm Linda Cohen. Oh, oh, um, thank you so much for, your, for this plan. I'd like to make some points about Staten Island's North Shore waterways. First of all, about waterfront public access. The old North Shore railroad line, which ran for miles along the waterfront starting at the Staten Island Ferry now lies mostly dormant and rotting and in some areas it's fallen into the Kilvan Cull. This could be a wonderful greenway like other neighborhoods have or are planning with the aids of the Parks Department and the MTA. Number two, about water quality. The Port Richmond sewage treatment plant on the North Shore is old with limited capacity and for years activists has, have called for an upgrade. Yet during recent LTCP plans by D DEP to reduce CEO in CSO in our waterways, DEP didn't recommend any projects for the Kill Van Cull or the Arthur Kill, two of the dirtiest waterways in New York. In an article in Curbed, the Director of Water Quality Planning at the DEP stated, for the Kill Van Cull, we looked at probably 100 different scenarios, but we couldn't find anything that worked there. My question is why? Also, much of the Arthur Kill on our West Shore is across from the New Jersey oil refineries. They have been fined many times for releasing their chemical byproducts into the air and into the waters of the Arthur Kill. This continues to affect residents, marine life, and tourists who kayak in the creeks, creeks and boat great graveyards of the Arthur Kill. Working waterfront. The Army Corps already deepened the Kilvan Cull to 50 feet to allow for bigger cargo ships to pass under the Bayonne Bridge. 
Now they are proposing dredging to 55 feet for even bigger ships in a project that will last for more than 10 years. North Shore residents along with the EPA have voiced concerns over the noise and the blasting and the resuspension of settled toxins that will occur. Number four, economic opportunity. A middle school for harbor education was proposed for Fort Wadsworth as a feeder school to the harbor school on Governor's Island. It seemed to gain traction as a great location, but then the idea seemed to have disappeared. Our kids rarely learn about our waterways and know little about what we see in our harbor and the possible employment opportunities involved, including the many tugboats, the containerized um, cargo barges, uh, the vast operations of Howl and Hook, um, the well-paying jobs in the maritime industry are not going to our residents. Number five, ferries. Snug Harbor is a tourist destination and it's a gem on the Kill Van Cull waterfront. It had a dock that was ruined during Superstorm Sandy. It seems that there are no funds set aside for repair and I'd like to know why. Also, I'm happy that we're getting a second ferry now to the west side of Manhattan, but I hope that we can soon also have a ferry connections to the other hubs in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. And finally, I'd like to mention for climate change, the BJ Strip Mall project at Granville Wetlands will destroy 18 acres of wetlands and forest in an environmental justice community. According to DCP flood hazard mapper and DCP stormwater flood models, this area is at <clears throat> severe risk of flooding. Ms. Cohen, I'm sorry, your time. Oh, please wrap up. Okay, concerned residents spoke to Mayor de Blasio, Janie Bavishi, and Commissioner Lago, and there has been no response. There should be a city process put in place to buy coastal wetland properties that pose significant flooding risks in EJ communities. This is an environmental justice community such as Graniteville wetlands. Thank you so much. I hope that you include these issues in, in your um, reporting. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Rosa Chang, followed by Charles Denson, followed by Cristobal Vivar. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Rosa Chang and I'm a co-founder of Brooklyn Bridge Manhattan, which is a nonprofit that was formed to convert a parking lot under the Brooklyn Bridge into a park. Um, I applaud everything that I've read actually in your plan goals and appreciate all the efforts that you've put into creating this amazing comprehensive document. Um, I want to consider the word resilient in a wider context. This past year of being absolutely slammed by COVID has shown us that not only our built environment needs to be resilient, that fostering resiliency must be a goal for our communities and our people. It is the people that make New York City what we are all here tonight to try and protect our homes, our businesses, and our culture. Without the diversity, creativity, yearning, and striving, inspirations, joys, and heartbreaks that make each day here so full and rich with possibility, we would not choose to be here. As you have noted in your plan, coronavirus has really focused on how essential our connection between people, land and water is, and how at this critical juncture, we need to reconsider and reprioritize how they overlap and how they can create a real synergy to reinvigorate our communities. Um, I support planning to create proactive strategies, as you mentioned, and I'm very concerned that nine years after Hurricane Sandy, we still don't have a plan for protecting the east side of lower Manhattan. Uh, I support investing in communities that have traditionally been excluded from civic infrastructural investment, uh, creating and uh, stewarding public spaces on the waterfront that involve true community engagement in its design construction and maintenance. I support community science efforts that also focus on education, especially our younger children. Just because we live in New York City doesn't mean we can't appreciate, learn from, or marvel at nature. Increasing coordination between capital infrastructure planning and habitat uh, restoration is an absolute must. And I know sewage isn't a, a you know a popular topic, but I think it's absolutely necessary to address that and what we do with the runoffs that happen into our waters, especially as we want to create stronger connections with our waterways. Supporting community-based organizations, especially under um, in vacant or underutilized city-owned properties, and especially large infrastructure community dividers with um, that are in locations with little to non-existent access to public parkland. I support um, 
investment in the community, this is going to be a huge cost and a huge effort. And every dollar should be working five times to protect the city, to create a teachable experience for our next generation, to invest in local sustainable technology and businesses, to create a publicly accessible park or experience that brings our communities together, that creates jobs and creates experiences that we will be proud of sharing with our families, our neighbors and the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, if you are interested in speaking this evening, please do the rate, use the raised hand feature in Zoom. Um, and Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Charles Denson, followed by Cristobal Vivar, followed by Claudia Toback. Charles Denson, begin when you're ready. Charles Denson, please begin whenever you're ready. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm director of the Coney Island History Project. I support ferries, but sometimes ferry projects run counter to the goals and strategies proposed in the waterfront plan. There needs to be more accountability for projects that negatively affect communities. Most New York City ferry docks are located in former industrial areas attached to hard bulkheads. Coney Island will be the only dock located at a small beach where people are now swimming, fishing, praying, and boating. It's the only ferry line that will tra transit an extremely narrow channel with inherent navigational risks. The proposed dredging for the ferry dock at Kaiser Park Fishing Pier will expose the surrounding community to toxic materials in the air and water, and no mitigation has been proposed for this site. The ferry site at Kaiser Park will destroy and despoil an environmentally vulnerable section of Coney Island Creek currently used for recreation and education. Construction of the ferry dock will negatively impact and obliterate the only safe public access to Coney Island Creek. Kaiser Park provides the safest place to conduct research, monitor horseshoe crabs, and launch rowboats, kayaks, and underwater robotics. This location is currently used by many community-based environmental organizations. The young stewards of Coney Island Creek, mostly youth of color from the neighborhood, will lose their environmental classroom because of the ferry project. The ferry project will also impact the horseshoe crab habitat on that beach. The pier and adjacent sandbar are also known as the best fishing spot for a local community of subsistence anglers. Fish caught at this location are coming from the ocean and considered safer to eat than fish that live in the creek. Fishing at the pier and shoreline will be severely impacted by the ferry operation. The site adjacent to the pier is also a winter waterfall refuge on the Atlantic Flyway that will be destroyed by the ferry operation. The ferry will reverse 50 years of improvements on Coney Island Creek. In other words, this ferry does not belong in Kaiser Park. The waterfront, waterfront plan should take this sort of thing into consideration when planning future projects. This location was chosen by politics, not science. For more information, you can see the video called Environmental Racism and the Coney Island Ferry that's currently on YouTube. And growing up in Coney Island and watching Coney Island Creek improve, it's so sad to see this reversal. And it's against all of the goals of the waterfront plan. Currently, we have many of those things in place. And when the ferry comes in, this will all end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Cristobal Vivar, followed by Claudia Toback, followed by Chauncey Young. Cristobal Vivar, please begin when you're ready. Cristobal Vivar, please begin when you're ready. Hello. Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, there you are. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I love everything I've been hearing. Um, I love the rivers. As a friend said, um, the wilderness in New York City is the river. 
you know, it's um, our access to nature. So it's um, something that I really love. Uh, there's three issues that I uh, would like to talk to. Uh, I'm uh, a um, uh, open water swimmer. I'm also a stand-up boarder um, and I also cycle. So all these issues are related to the waterfront. Um, as a swimmer, and the water quality is very important. And uh, right now I depend on uh, river keepers uh, studies uh, on, uh, their, um, on their water testing. And uh, we need better water testing, uh, more methodical. Um, right now they only test for E. coli. Uh, we need testing for other chemicals, even radioactivity, even though uh, our not beloved uh, nuclear power plant is gone. Um, and uh, that they are visible and available to the public, you know, that you don't have to go online or, you know, if there's a sign at the beach that says, today's water quality is excellent, people will swim more, right? You know, I've had like, even like the most aggressive reactions to, uh, to me telling people that I swim in the river and I love it. It's the most wonderful thing. Um, so yes, water testing, extremely important. Um, as a standard uh, paddler, um, I, um, I agree with my friend Orbachi, who spoke recently. Um, we have to make sure that um, there are more docks available and that they are open year round because many of us um, do it year round. Uh, and also that they are open to the general public because many of them are closed. We have them, but uh, we have to skip fences to use them. And sometimes it, that's not even possible because it's raised above the water. Um, uh, right now in our neighborhood, uh, we have uh, a dock that's um, very large and it's usually open to the public and you know, open year round. Um, it's maintained by Columbia University and it's close. It's not a priority for them to fix it. And it's gonna be a whole season for us lost there. And you know, meanwhile, we have to access through rocks or uh, high tide, it's complicated and dangerous. Um, and as a cyclist, um, I also, I, I don't know if this applies um, to the waterfront, but it's right next to it. Uh, there is um, the issue of increased uh, ridership. There's a lot more users. The same with stand-up boarders and kayakers. Now we have these inflatable stand-up boards and origami kayaks. So there's a lot more users, especially the last year. There was an explosion in uh, use, users. Um, uh, with, uh, smart. Please wrap up. Yes, uh, with bicycles, uh, there's the issue of uh, elect electric bikes, which are very dangerous and um, that there's a lot more of us. So we need broader paths and some way to deal with uh, electric bikes because they're like motorcycles. That's all, thank you so much. Thank you. Just a reminder, if you are interested in speaking this evening, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom uh, and you'll be added to the queue. Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Claudia Toback, followed by Chauncey Young, followed by Raymond Lin. Claudia Toback, please begin whenever you're ready. I hope you can hear me now. We can, yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Claudia Toback, and I am a resident of Staten Island's North Shore, actually uh, in the neighborhood called St. George. I love the neighborhood. Uh, uh, it's been in my home. I actually lived in Staten Island since 1968, and I really consider it my hometown, even though I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, several issues have come to mind when I think about what's being done here on the island. And I have issues as well as many others as well. For an example, the famous uh, Bay Street Corridor, which will have several buildings built along the Stapleton waterfront. Of course, now it looks like a war zone. Uh, recently, they uh, removed some uh, trailers 
that were just sitting there taking up space. But the issue is the increase in pedestrians, traffic, and other concerns. Uh, we heard from an earlier speaker that the Port Richmond Sewage Treatment Plant is near its end in terms of capacity. And of course, feeding into it will be those who are living in this, these developments. Another one planned is something called Liberty Towers, which is almost directly across from uh, the, the ill-fated uh, wheel. Uh, and of course, not only will it impact the uh, congestion along that area of Richmond Terrace, but also put a strain on other infrastructures, such as, again, the Port Richmond Sewage Treatment Plant. Now, they want to change uh, that whole area where it's to be built into R R7. And uh, that would be the only place in Staten Island that would have that zoning. Uh, something else that has to be addressed is the Graniteville Swamp, BJ's is planning on building on that property when next door a movie theater is vacant that could be retrofitted rather than take part of that uh, storms uh, air and excuse me that um, swamp and lastly it's the city issuing variances in blue belts Ridiculous. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Tovek. Tom, who do we have next as our speaker? Our next speaker is Chauncey Young, followed by Raymond Lynn, followed by Mary Had. Sorry, Mary Habstrit. Chauncey Young, please begin whenever you're ready. Yes, good evening. Um, my name is Chauncey Young. Um, I'm a resident of over 15 years in the Highbridge neighborhood of the Bronx. Uh, I serve as coordinator for the Harlem River uh, Working Group um, and I'm an avid bicyclist and uh, user of the waterfront. Um, I first would like to say as a Bronx resident, um, I had a strong reaction for seeing the Har Bronx Harlem River Greenway uh, once again not on the uh, planning documents, um, which is in goal 1.4 on page 20. Um, it was surprised that it was not uh, mentioned as one of the specific Greenway improvements that was identified. Um, it sort of indicates the, the long-term issue of not seeing uh, Greenway development in the Bronx outside of um, the Bronx River um, as a priority by the city. Um, since the first Greenway plan was adopted in the Bronx in the early 1990s, it's been an ongoing struggle to even keep the Harlem River Greenway in planning documents, let alone getting it constructed. Over the last 12 years since the Harlem River Working Group was created, we've lost um, over 50 acres of land along the Harlem River waterfront including uh, 40 acres of uh, CXX property was sold to a private developer only last year. Um, these are all long-term plans uh, that the community needs if we're going to have equal access to greenway and waterfront. Uh, there's currently only one uh, accessible space with a dock on the Harlem River on the Bronx side. Um, that is in Robert Clemente State Park. Um, and that is not publicly accessible. Uh, when you compare that with the Manhattan side where the mayor has just committed $723 million to complete the Greenway, uh, which is the Harlem River Greenway on the Manhattan side, inward Greenway, uh, there's a real issue of economic uh, justice and uh, racial and uh, 
environmental justice. So we need waterfront access, we need boat access, we need bicycle access, we need the city to prioritize the Bronx and commit funding instead of selling our parklands to private developers. Uh, we lost five acres only five years ago, taking Pier 5, which had been designated as parkland, and the city uh, sold that uh, to a developer to build public housing and a museum. We support the museum. We don't support losing parkland on the waterfront. So please prioritize the Bronx and have economic uh, and environmental justice in this plan. Uh, do not limit the Bronx and put more funding and more plans into the Bronx waterfront. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, just a reminder, if you are interested in speaking this evening, uh, please do use the raised hand feature in Zoom. And Tom, who do we have up next to speak? Our next speaker is Raymond Lind, uh, followed by Mary Habstrit. Raymond Lind, please begin. Hi, I'm Raymond and I'm from MassPath. Um, I just wanted to talk about industrial uses as well as um, how I use the Greenway. So um, one of the main things I want to talk about first is coastal highways. There's lots of parkland that have highways where high speed traffic goes behind them. And I really strongly believe that these highways should not be along the coastline. It is um, bad from like when events happen and they are flooded and they're like avenues of ways to affect homes and other places. Um, they are polluting, they affect how parkland is used and quite a lot. And I strongly believe that especially redundant highways should be removed along waterfronts. I can think of the Harlem River Parkway north of GWB as a prime example of this. Um, another example definitely to bring back to Chris's point, um, we need better oversight of private public partnerships. Um, the Shore Towers is legally obligated to provide a greenway access along the shore. And they have built it, but they have locked it off and made it not available to the public most of the time and has prohibited biking on that such on such a you know on such a place. That should not be allowed. And there should be much more stringent enforcement of private entities that break contracts with the city when it comes to greenway access. And also very important um, industrial transportation and uh, sewage usage on the waterfront strongly needs to be regulated. I strongly believe that um, these industries should not be dumping toxic waste and they haven't, thank goodness for a long time, but we need to make sure that a disaster like what happened in Greenpoint doesn't happen again. And we need to make sure that the cleanups efforts on the Superfund sites are you know, moving ahead. I haven't seen anything from Newson Creek um, but it should, you know, happen. And definitely we need to look into whether or not excess, like transportation, industrial is, and sewage usage is really necessary along these places. Um, the prime example I can think of is LaGuardia Airport. I think LaGuardia should not, you know, it really shouldn't exist these days. It really, you really shouldn't be promoting short term flights. Instead, it should be like a park like Barlin Templehof or, um, Hong Kong's uh, airport, but they replaced, um, you know, with the new international airport a few years ago. So that's what I strongly believe. I think these two points are really important. Um, probably th think of something more, I'll probably drop them in a comment later. Thank Great. you for your time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And as a reminder um, to everyone who is interested in submitting written comments, um, you are welcome to do so as well. You can go to our website, waterfrontplan.nyc. Uh, and submit your comments that way. Um, once again, if you're interested in speaking tonight, um, please do use the raise hand feature in Zoom. It appears that we only have one more speaker signed up. Tom, is that correct? That's correct. Oh, it looks like we got one more coming as well. Um, and if there's anyone who is uh, dialing in and wanting to uh, speak, press the star nine key. Uh, keys on your phone to uh, to raise your hand as well. Hey, okay, Tom, who is, our, who is our currently our last speaker, but recognizing a few more may, may come in as well. Or who is just our next speaker? Just one note. Yeah. Sure, just one note. 
um, if you would like to speak and want to use the raise hand feature, um, just click it once so that it stays up. If you click it again, you'll be removed from the queue. Um, so our next speaker is Mary Habstrit, followed by Maya Shaw. And yes, followed by Maya Shaw. Great, Mary Hasbrit, please begin when you're ready. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, this is Mary Habstrit, and I am the museum director at the historic Coast Guard Headed Lilac, which is currently moored in Hudson River Park. I am also a member of the Historic Ships Coalition representing historic vessels in New York Harbor and a recent um, resident of St. George on Staten Island. So I was very happy to hear many of my North Shore neighbors participating tonight. As an operator of a historic ship, I'm going to focus on infrastructure and safety. Um, I was very glad to see that evacuation considerations have been included in um, discussion of infrastructure and the goals and um, strategies. Um, as the city that has hosted one of the largest evacuations by water in history on 9-11, it's critical that we keep that in mind as we build and rebuild piers and equip them properly. The other thing is with the emphasis on getting people to the water, we also have to think about how to get them out. And there is some consideration of safety under the goals and strategies related to swimming, but I would like to suggest that we need to set standards for life rings and ladders to help people get out of the water if they're in trouble there. Um, lastly, I would like to say that many of the piers in the city are public property and operated by the New York City Economic Development um, Corporation. And unfortunately, they're not answerable to the public. And in many cases, we've had great difficulty getting the EDC to listen to the public. I think we really need to look at that model and see if there's some other way we can handle it. One key example is Pier 1 on Staten Island outside the National Lighthouse Museum. A large portion of that pier has been condemned and the community wants to know what's wrong with it and what needs to be done and they can't get any answers. I think, um, we really need to look at if that's the right agency to be operating the city's peers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Tom, our next speaker. So it looks like we have a few more lined up now. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, our next speaker is Maya Shaw, followed by uh, Lionel Ponce. Maya Shaw, please begin whenever you're ready. Hi, how are you? Um, actually, Moira Williams for oh, Maya me. Shaw from, from um, that's okay, from Works on Water. Maya Shaw is part of Works on Water. Um, and um, I am a disabled person living in New York City. And I want to point out um, the differences in the plan that talk about um, access points versus accessibility points for the over 950,000 plus disabled people living in New York City. Um, we need accessible points to be created and clearly noted on site maps, on site and on maps, on waterfront literature, plus all waterfront info needs to follow current accessibility guidelines. Um, I also understand and I would uh, that the NYC's disabled community was not fully part of the planning conversation. Um, I deeply feel that the plan misses a, a huge opportunity for transformation and different ways of using the waterfront and um, of course inclusion due to the absence of New York City's cross disability um, population and communities. Um, plus, I, I'd like to see um, more conversations on the waterfront about accessible ferries and access beyond just seeing the water, but also being able to enter the water for disabled people. And I'd also like to see more conversation and um, real plans for um, emergency plans for 
um, disabled people during during flooding and and bad weather. Um, disabled people are the largest community in New York City that move across race, gender, and class. And we'd love to be part more part of the waterfront planning. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Leonel Ponce. Leonel, please begin when you're ready. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the DCP team, Mike and everyone else. Uh, you know, this is always a Herculean effort to try and you know, encompass everyone's, uh, all of the advocates' uh, interests and, and uh, concerns in this process. Um, and especially in light of, of the pandemic. So thank you all for that effort. Um, I just want to, I'm, I'm the uh, academic coordinator at Pratt Institute's Master of Science in Sustainable Environmental System and, and also a steering committee member at the Stormwater Infrastructure Matters Coalition. But I'll be speaking uh, on my own behalf as a, as, a, as a citizen. Today, we'll be submitting uh, written comments separately as the SWIM Coalition. I just wanted to bring uh, some attention to some of the uh, structural um, aspects of the plan as it stands right now. Um, one is the uh, relative absence of specific targets and metrics. Uh, understanding that this is not uh, an enforceable plan, it's an aspirational plan. It would be good to incorporate uh, as possible uh, specific metrics and targets and, and that we can then uh, look back upon and track progress towards. Um, this is specifically a concern uh, in the water quality uh, goal, as it refers to existing uh, plans and, and, and programs and policies that, are, that may not be as aspirational and maybe just, uh, and are often just uh, intended to be, uh, to comply with existing regulations. We really should be striving, especially if we're going to be using the waterfront more often for fishable, swimmable, accessible, uh, waterfront that promotes health equity and resiliency as outlined in the plan, but we need to have specific metrics in order to understand what that means and what we're striving for. Uh, the other aspect of the plan that, um, that I think uh, could potentially be addressed is intersection between the different things. We know that there needs, you know, there needs to be some organizational aspects to a plan but uh, it seems that some of these issues are siloed and it was brought up a couple of times in the comments today, specifically around Coney Island Creek and the North Shore of Staten Island and in the Bronx that the issues of equity and of uh, water quality uh, are often uh, not clearly articulated and sometimes seem in, di in direct opposition to some of the development pressures and even some of the resilience uh, concerns that are expressed in those sections. Uh, so a waterfront development uh, that might be economically viable uh, could be in the, in the direct opposition to, say, wetland preservation in, in the North Shore of Staten Island. Um, so thank you for that. Great. Thank you. Uh, as of the moment, it does not appear that we have any other speakers, so we'll just give it a second. Um, I, uh, if you are interested in speaking, please do use the raised hand feature in Zoom. You only have to click it once. Um, uh, it appears that Joe Hardigan is clicking it many, many times. Um, Joe, if you're interested in speaking, um, I believe one of my colleagues can uh, can um, let you on, but it seems uh, that we have a couple of, uh, at least one other person up next. So Joe, if you are interested in speaking, just click, click the button once so that your name adds to the queue. Don't click it twice because you'll get removed from the queue. Uh, Tom, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Maggie Clark. Ms. Clark, please, please begin when you're ready. Ms. Clark? Can you hear oh, me? You yes. yes, please begin. 
Good. All right. So uh, I'll be delivering some written comments uh, tomorrow. I'm waiting to hear what the actual deadline is for that uh, from the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. Um, get right into it. Uh, efforts to mitigate climate impacts uh, via reducing carbon emissions should not only prioritize transportation and energy conservation, but equally zero waste initiatives since EPA data show that half of carbon emissions emanate from production, transportation, and use of consumer products, packaging, and food. Therefore, reducing consumption via education, increased support for reuse and repair, recycling and composting are meaningful solutions to climate change, and that should be in the plan. Since damaging storms will continue to occur on a more frequent basis, the waterfront plan should recommend development of and implement educational programs annually to advise residents and businesses to separate compostable vegetative debris and recyclable metals and concrete into separate piles. The waterfront plan should also recommend funding of wood chippers and emergency recyclables sorting capacity and plan for their storage and deployment and emergency contracting. Two concepts that you raise, limiting future densities in waterfront areas and also preserving and creating new housing, offering resources to manage flood impacts are at odds. We favor the limiting future density near the coast as any encouragement to building or staying in floodplains uh, will result in increased avoidable generation of waste as, rel as well as risk to life. Specifically, there should be mention and development of the concept of manage retreat from the coastline. This should be the driving philosophy to avoid impacts of storms. Housing mobility sounds optional. Climate change is a certainty. Managed retreat should be the message and it should be planned starting now. The first step for planned for managing retreat is don't put new and renovated developments in the floodplain. Incentives to move should be offered. There are precedents for this. Up zonings in the floodplain are the opposite of what is needed since it puts more lives and property in harm's way. From far Rockaway to Inwood, there are tall buildings proposed for the floodplains and this should be undone. We should be down zoning in those areas, not up zoning. Protection of coastal properties and infrastructure is antithetical to managed retreat. It's very expensive and it's ultimately futile and will create needless waste. If the money were used to buy out properties at risk, it would be better spent and we would arrive at a more sustainable waterfront more quickly and without destruction of property. Protection of coastal properties and infrastructure, uh, sorry, um, more development as is planned in all the up zonings equals more water pollution and air pollution and carbon emissions. The DEC is tasked with enforcing the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts in our state. The city has been in contravention of both of these since the 1970s and adding more population necessarily adds more wastewater and more tailpipe pollution. Building more will not improve water or air quality. Um, so, Ms. Clark, please wrap up your statements since you're over time. Um, I, I am done. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone else is interested in speaking this evening, please do raise the hand, raise your hand feature. Um, Tom, who do we have next? We have Lewis Kleinman. Great. Lewis, please begin whenever you're ready. Lewis, please begin. <clears throat> Lewis Kleinman, please begin whenever you're ready. Lewis, if you're still interested in speaking, please begin when you're ready. I keep muting, but somebody's unmuting me. Okay. We're, 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 okay. So process. When? Uh, what's the time frame for this? When will it be finished? Will we receive uh, 
documentation to indicate uh, what the final uh, plan looks like uh, or a link to the final plan? Uh, will we have the ability, in fact, to review your final plan or is this the end of it? Thank you, Lewis. You are, uh, you're jumping ahead to my closing statement, but um, let's just give it a minute and see if there is anyone else with comments um, before we wrap things up. So I'll talk about all of that in just a moment. But appreciate your focus on next steps. Oh. Uh, last uh, Joe Hardigan is our next speaker. Okay, Joe, please, whenever you're ready to begin. Joe, are you able to unmute yourself and speak? Hello? Yes, Joe, please begin. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing wrong here, but I'm happy you got a hold of me. Uh, number one, on ferry service, I would like it that the, the airports are connected. I've been on demo runs from Lowell, Lower Manhattan to Kennedy Airport, 45 minutes. LaGuardia Airport could be done tomorrow. I would also like SBS routes connected to the waterfront, uh, select bus service routes uh, to the ferry docks. Uh, you're going to have six, five or six uh, SBS routes into Main Street Flushing. It's less than two blocks to the uh, Flushing Creek, we could have ferry service in there. I would just like that to be considered. And the next thing is bike paths to the ferry dock because there's going to be an explosion of electric bikes. Uh, that's basically it. The other one is you have to include New Jersey. Uh, you talk about moving freight by water, but if you don't include New Jersey, that's where all the freight's coming from. You have to include them. And also they have 16, I think 16 ferry locations in New Jersey between uh, Atlantic Highlands and the Gold Coast. So you also want to include them because we want those tours. That's about it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. It does not appear that we have anyone else currently lined up. To, oh, we do have one more speaker. Um, Tom, who do we have next? Our, our next speaker is Andrea Hange. Please begin when you're ready. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Thanks so yes, much. We can. I was yesterday here too, and I'm coming today again. I'm actually speaking um, on behalf of Drifting Olva. It came after the full moon this morning when I went to the Marsha P. Johnson's um, beach, and it was there. And on behalf of the Olva, I will actually think, I will use my two minutes and 30 seconds, but Olva has a different language. And so, spare with me. Olva? recognized when it comes onto land, at that time it will dry out. On that supposed beach, recognized below that beach is actually material that stops that the, that the sand and other plants cannot come. A beach that we maybe think is, as, is a beach, all one knows it's something different. With that, all what asked and taught me to think about what, what we actually ask when the landscape architects or when we want an esplanade, what kind of material we using actually, what we stepping on, we all want access and there needs to be many more access and all public allowed to, but what material is really used that allows an ecosystem to thrive. Thinking about this over, 
was here before we hear evolutionary. How we actually could making other ecosystems that we actually don't know, not even thinking about what was in the past. Although, even here now, I did give water, smells salty. And with that, I ask you to take a breath in your home where you are, seeing what's around you, how far and where are your feet are, and how far it will take you, or how the water flows be your feet into the rivers. Olva and I thank you for listening. Thank you. Tom, do we have any additional speakers this evening? It does not appear so. Oh, oh, we, we just do. have. <laughs> We, yes. Um, our next speaker is Florence uh, Kluris, uh, and followed by, uh, I believe, Chauncey Young already spoke. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Florence Kluris, please begin. Florence Kolaris, please begin when you're, when you're ready. Hi, good evening, everybody. I have a very brief question. I've heard a lot of um, questions regarding ferry service. While you're talking about the ferry service, is there any information around the Omni being linked to the ferry service so that all of our residents throughout the city of New York can go from mass transportation, buses and trains to the ferries. Since the ferry service is being discussed, this would be very interesting to hear about. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Uh, it appears that, that is currently the last speaker that we have signed up to speak for this evening who has not already spoken. Uh, I'll just remind you one more time that if you are interested in speaking this evening, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Additionally, if you are interested in uh, providing written comment, you can go to our website, waterfrontplan.nyc.gov. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, waterfrontplan.nyc.gov, and you can uh, submit your comments through our website. Um, both comments written and spoken are given equal weight. Um, I would like to note that uh, if uh, any comments that we receive, either written or spoken, we absolutely take seriously as we have throughout this process. Um, the next steps for this work is that we will be, uh, uh, we will be uh, sharing the comments with our partnering agencies and discussing the comments with those, recognizing that so much of what we are talking about uh, today is beyond the, um, the scope of, uh, of just the Department of City Planning, um, and we play a coordinating role with our other agencies. Um, I just want to just take note, um, uh, if it's possible that um, the Chauncey Young, who um, did speak earlier. Um, is someone else using a different account? Um, there's some confusion amongst our, our team. Um, also with your login, perhaps you forwarded that email. If that's the case, just please make note uh, or raise your hand again. Um, I don't want to, I want to make sure that we have everyone uh, uh, who wants to speak tonight is able to speak, um, but you are only given one, one opportunity. So um, Chauncey, if you're looking to speak again, I'm afraid we, we would, um, would have to decline that request. Um, but if there's someone else using that, that same login, oh, it appears that that might be the case. Tom, could you unmute uh, Chauncey? Um, 
logged in under Chauncey Young. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I kept raising my hand, but you kept saying Chauncey. Okay. Got I it. really could, want to. Could you identify yourself, please? I'm sorry. Joyce Hoagie. Sounds like a sandwich, spelled a little differently. But I am a resident of the South Bronx, also part of the Harold River Working Group and the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality. And I just want to echo what Chauncey uh, testified to, is that our borough has been notoriously shortchanged on getting access to not only the water, but park space. We have a plaque mounted in a park that identified an additional five acres for expanding that park, which isn't large enough for the amount of people who use it. So the city in its wisdom or not gave that park plan to a developer to develop housing. And they threw in a sweetener as a hip hop museum, as if that makes it right. Uh, we are having building going on all around us. We're in the highest asthma area of the city, practically of the country, because of all the highways around us and truck traffic. And the city is shortchanging us by allowing all the building and not compensating equally with parkland. So I just needed to get that out there. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Great. Thank you. Ms. Ogie. Okay, uh, it appears that we no longer have anyone else signed up to speak. Um, so we'll wrap things up. Uh, want to first and foremost, and Chris, if you could actually take off, take down the, the presentation and the clock. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating this evening. Um, this, as many of you who have been uh, participating in this process for now well over two years know that um, public engagement, the public outreach process is really central to the comprehensive waterfront plan and we take it very seriously. Um, and moments like tonight are really at the, at the center, at the core of the planning process. Um, and so tonight, as I, uh, after tonight, as I said, we'll be um, collecting all of the comments, both written and spoken and we'll be um, studying them carefully, sharing them with our partnering agencies, discussing with them with our partnering agencies, and revising the draft goals and strategies uh, you know, based on those conversations. It's not to say that um, we are going to necessarily be able to give everyone what they are looking for, but I can guarantee you that we will be taking them seriously and discussing them amongst our partnering agencies. Um, We, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, we uh, will be uh, looking to issue the plan this summer. Um, uh, this will be the last opportunity to comment during the uh, public engagement process from here on out, um, which is not much more, uh, not much longer, I should say, that uh, we will be, uh, it will be internal hereafter, um, where we are going to be uh, uh, looking to, uh, as I said, wrap up the plan in the next uh, next uh, bit of time. Uh, I do want to make certain that uh, you recognize, again, if you are interested in written, providing written comments, go to nyc. Excuse me, waterfrontplan.nyc. Um, there you can submit your written comments and uh, from the uh, and that you are able to submit comments uh, through the end of tomorrow. That's uh, till 11.59 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and uh, please, uh, please do so. Um, we do ask that you use the online form. It does actually help us uh, with your written comments to have everything um, organized through the form, uh, because as I said, it 
we uh, want to keep everything organized to share with our partner agencies. Um, but I do again want to thank all of you for, for participating this evening and throughout this process, this uh, uh, long uh, process to get us to where we are now and to get us uh, past the finish line in just a, in just a short period of time hereafter. Um, with that, I want to thank the entire uh, team uh, at DCP to help put together uh, this these sessions. Um, though you may not see it, there's a team of about a, uh, close to a dozen folks working behind the scenes to make sure Zoom works properly. Um, so I very much want to uh, to thank all of them uh, for the work that they do uh, as part of this as well. Um, but once again, most importantly, thank all of you for participating. Um, please be in touch. Please provide your written comments. And uh, we will absolutely be letting everyone know when the plan is completed now. So thank you very much. Have a good night. And thank you for participating. Bye now.